Thank you for that little prompt. That's a great idea because I know I had several emails from people saying that they wanted to be here but wouldn't be able to make it. So officially, welcome to the Protect Your Assets and specifically Protect Your Online Assets Masterclass. We are going to be walking through some things today that should help you with a legal roadmap in your business. What the whole reason, actually what you're about to see, the whole reason that that came about is because of my frustration with the legal industry and how information basically stays in a black box, right? I think it is one of the unique industries where it can be really hard for people to get even some basic information to know where to begin, what questions to ask, what supports they need. And um, just in working, and I've, I've been in law now for over 20 years, and in working with thousands of entrepreneurs, um, I've heard so frequently their frustrations in their own journey about trying to connect to the right resources, trying to connect to somebody that understands their business, trying to, you know, understand what questions they should be asking. Um, and so really, I wanted a simplified way of giving people the roadmap to their own business because the people that I serve, I, I chose a very specific niche after practicing law for probably 12, uh, 12 years, 10 to 12 years, I really thought, gosh, there's a, there's a better, different way to do this. And um, my heart is with entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story and why that is. But um, I really thought I can choose a specific subset of the small business legal market that is not well served by the traditional legal industry and go very deep into that niche and really understand their needs and serve them well. And so that's what my goal has been. And I it's just been such an enjoyable journey for me. And every day I connect with amazing entrepreneurs up to amazing things. And I love seeing the ins and outs of their business and helping them understand from a legal perspective how to approach it. So um, I am going to turn this slideshow into read mode. This gets rid of the sidebar. Give me just a second and I will share my screen. Uh, you're welcome to take screenshots, right? Don't, don't worry about like scrambling down notes or... Um, you know, having to, uh, I, I, I say that because I am a notorious note taker. I literally, it's, I think there's a disease, there's a name for it when you take too many notes. I have that, but I always like other people to feel like you can just rest and enjoy the presentation, take screenshots if you need to capture some of the information, or um, even, you know, if you want me to share some additional resources or slides, you can also poke a comment into the chat or email me. Um, all right, so if you haven't already, make sure that you pop in to the chat and let me know where you're coming from in the world, but I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let me know if you guys can see this. You see that all right? Did that come up? Okay, getting head nods, all right. The only thing I don't like about that is then everybody's faces gets little, right? So I'm gonna drag you guys around just a little bit so I can still see some faces. Um, okay, and then I have to reopen the chat. Want to make sure that if people have questions as we go along, that we uh, that I'm able to see those because the chat goes away once I share screen. Okay, um, all right. So um, this is all. This entire presentation is really about protecting your assets, right? And we've got a variety of assets in our life, and you know we can dig into what those look like. But essentially, as an entrepreneur, you're going to create assets in your business, and hopefully those translate to assets in your personal life, right? But this is really about that the, the job of legal and legal supports is to help you be in business safely, to help you do your business with confidence, serve people, create information, you know, do all of the amazing things that we get to do through our businesses, but do it with support and structure. And so often, and you'll see later on as well, I joke that the online world of business is the wild west of business. The internet, you know, really truthfully is still fairly new. Yes, it's, you know, been around since the late 90s, but it took people quite a while to kind of get to know the internet and start to do things online. And um, 
And really what we've seen in recent years is that regulations and laws are starting to catch up with small businesses um, and, and people still generally don't understand what those rules are, which just means that a lot of small businesses, especially if you don't have team, you don't have in-house legal counsel, it's really easy to step in potholes that are regulated potholes, right? Issues that can, can really cause a hurdle for your business. And so um, what I tell people about the legal nuggets that you need to know is it's not that hard but you do need to have access to the right information. And a little bit of the right information goes a long way. And that's my job to get you the right information, right? So that's my goal is to break it down, make it as simple as possible. I want this to feel very accessible and that you walk away from today with a roadmap, understanding the buckets of protection. We'll go through a, a you know, a, a visual that I created that will show you the um, the various buckets that we'll be looking in. All right, let me see. All right, so how many of you type yes in the chat if you consider yourself an entrepreneur? I'd be curious if you relate to that word, if you have some other title, but do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Yes, okay, Bill says yes, Angela, yes, Eva, yes. Okay, excellent. And, you know, it's interesting because I think entrepreneur can mean different things to different people, but there was probably a point in time when you made that decision, right? It's not something that most people do. Less than 10% of people become an entrepreneur, right? It's a, it's a minority. It is a choice that most of us make. And, you know, I want you right now to reflect back. Think about the time. Lynn says working on it. I get that too. Um, think back to the time when you made a choice to become an entrepreneur, to go out on your own, to do something different than what most people do, right? Think back to that time. How many of you decided to become an entrepreneur because you thought it would be easy? Lady Jane, I love it. I am an entrepreneur. Yeah, Bill says laugh out loud, right? Yeah, we we don't make the choice to become entrepreneurs generally. I, although one one person, my friend Jay Facet, sat in the front row of one of my presentations one day, and when I asked that question, he goes, "Yeah," but he tells the story about thinking like he could stay home in bunny slippers and make mega millions, you know, within months. So if you didn't fall prey to one of those myths that get sold online, right, you probably didn't sign up for entrepreneurship thinking that it would be easy. And I've never once had somebody go, yeah, I actually really thought it would be easy. Um, create, yes, but right. Why did you do it? If it's not because you thought it would be easy, what was your why? Right. You thought it would be worth it. So what makes it worth it? I'd be really curious if you are willing to share your why in the chat, right? What makes it worth it for you? This is my why, right? Freedom, yes, family, right? I, I remember actually at the time that I made the decision to go to law school. And by the way, growing up, I never once thought of going to law school. It wasn't until I was in business school that I thought of law school. I love of helping women strut into their power. Yes, I relate to that so much. Freedom to choose my time. Yep, that's from Annie. Autonomy from Patty. Yes, all of these reasons, right, are a huge part of your core why, why you decided to make this leap, right? For me, it also represented, um, you know, the ability to face challenges, to build something creatively, to actually create my own security. A lot of people think a job is security. But how, how many of you know somebody who lost a job or thought they were on a career path and suddenly had no control over what direction they were going, right? Uh, Bill says corporate America had become too frustrating. Absolutely, right? Own my life and my destiny. I love it. So all of these reasons are what prompt us to become an entrepreneur, right? And it's a huge part of what keeps us going on this journey. Not everybody can do this journey and not everybody can stay on this journey, right? Am I right? You guys know, know people who've probably tried and quit. Joyful process. Yes, I love that. So um, my story is that 
right? And this is, a, I mean, I think for most of us, we are also interested in creating legacy, right? Creating something that has a ripple effect in the world and goes just beyond ourselves. And that can feel hard in a job. That can feel hard when you're doing somebody else's work. But when you're doing your own work, that can be a really uh, meaningful part of the process and the, the goal. Uh, Dot says, to live a life of adventure and teach others how to learn uh, to hire support. I love that. Felix says it's a challenge and a privilege. Yes, absolutely. All right. And we'll let, it looks like a few people are still rolling in. If you pop in, you're welcome to let me know uh, where you are in the world and what you're up to. I'd also be curious if you're willing to share what is your business about or what is your title? Do you, what do you call yourself? I'd love to know what people are actually doing in their business. So if you're willing to share in the chat, I'd love to know um, actually what you're up to. And that'll give me a sense of the types of businesses that are here. As I go along, I can speak to challenges directly uh, to those businesses, faced by those businesses. Um, so the quick story about me and type yes, if you've been through one of my presentations before, otherwise put new. I want to see who, who I've connected with before and who here is new. Okay, lots of news. Got it. New from Dot, new from Angela. Yep. All right, so um, Bill is B2B technology, marketing. I scroll back up, content development. Yes, also new to my presentation. Okay, perfect. New, it looks like, okay, this is great. This is what I hoped for. I wanted a lot of new folks so that we could get this information to people that I haven't spoken with before. Awesome. And if you're willing to share what you do, reminder to pop in and let me know what your business is about, right? Um, the quick overview of my story is that I, um, I launched my own practice right out of law school, right? I never once thought about, um, about going to law school, like I said, until I was in business school. And when I thought about my path, I knew I wanted more schooling and I knew I wanted it to be business related, but I was also clear that I was kind of full up on business. I, I was in the middle of a double major in finance and economics, and I wanted something that also would allow me some freedom, right? Now, um, fast forward a few years, once I was in law school, my mom was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, and that was the first quarter of my first year. And so um, I considered actually dropping out until her illness, you know, because we knew we had a limited time with her. It was glioblastoma, um, but my parents wouldn't allow that. And uh, so I spent my first year of law school three, three days a week in Seattle at University of Washington. And then I'd drive home middle of the week and spend the remaining three and a half days in Walla Walla and then drive back late on Sunday night. And that's how my first year of law school went. Um, but the, the reality is like everybody else seemed to be, I mean, free people who weren't facing, you know, trauma or tragedy in their life really got to do law school full in. And that was an introduction to me about like really looking at the bigger picture of life and law school was just one of the things I was doing on the way. And it really shaped my perspective about how willing I was when I graduated law school to do other people's work. I watched my mom die young. You know, she was in her 40s. She was actually my age now and passed away. And I was the second oldest of six kids. And so I had all my siblings, you know, that were younger than me that were in high school and junior high and it was just a devastating thing to experience. And so when I graduated law school, I made the decision that I was going to do what I wanted to do. And at the time, you know, it was the worst time, first of all, to graduate law school in like 30 years. 9-11 had happened uh, the year before. And um, yeah, when Lady says, how old was I when, I when she was diagnosed? I was in my early 20s, 22, I think. I think she was 23 when I passed away. It was the very start of my second year. Um, but, it, you know, we were a close-knit family and it really changed everything about life. And so even my perspective for the remainder of law school, I did well, but I, I could see very clearly that law school was one piece of what I was doing in life and that um, I had a much bigger perspective about 
you know, about work and my willingness to do work that I wasn't personally committed to. Um, so what it meant is that when I left law school, I hung out my own shingle. I This was back in the day, you guys, where I was like printing up my own business cards and sending out letterhead, all of that kind of stuff, letting people know I was done, I was ready for work. And um, and that's how I launched my career. And it was, you know, I look back and I think, man, what was I thinking, right? But at the same time, it was a perfect fit for me. And really the takeaway message that I want to share with people is the time is now. If there is work that you are committed to, and this is why I love, love, love working with entrepreneurs is because they generally are so committed to what they're doing. There is a big why behind it. And they're taking the risk now to do that work, to create something in the world, to create a pathway for themselves, to create meaningful change, right? All the reasons. But I relate so strongly to that mission because I've walked it. So that's just, you know, a key part of my story that I like to share so people can understand uh, a bit about my background. The other part of my why, of course, is my family, my kiddos. Took seven years and seven pregnancies to get these little munchkins here. And, um, you know, I think all of us want to create a better world for people that follow, but especially our kiddos. Um, the folks that I serve are also a big part of my why, right? They are, they go by different titles, right? They're coaches, they're consultants, they're industry experts, they are authors, they're speakers, they run all kinds of programs and courses, they have podcasts, right? They're doing everything in the online space that many of you are doing and uh, that many of my clients do regularly, right? But they go by different titles. And um, th the thing that I love about all of them is that they are really committed to having an impact in the world. And um, these are the people that I'm here to support, right? And I'm here to make legal support easier for these folks. And so that is my mission is to break down barriers into the legal world and providing education and like essential legal information first, making legal support very accessible and helping folks in this space thrive. So three parts that we will, three parts of the presentation today. Part one is understanding a bit about the legal landscape. And if you are international, how many of you do international business? Meaning that you have people outside of the US or outside of your home country opting into your database, engaging with your services, maybe joining your workshops or attending events. I'd like to know how many of you have databases like that. Yeah, I'm global. Yes, yes. Okay, seeing some yeses. I will have them. Perfect. Um, all right. It says I might potentially. Yes. Okay. Yep. And welcome. I think I just let Angela in. Welcome. We are just getting started into the three different segments of the presentation that we'll cover today. Um, introduce yourself in the chat if you want to. Let me know where you're at in the world. If you're new and you haven't yet, I might. Yes. Yeah. So the thing about online business that's so fascinating, right, is there's really, for many of us, no limits on who we can reach, on who we can support. I mean, some of us obviously have professional licenses, and so there are going to be certain limits that go along with that. But from an education standpoint, from um, especially if you're in the coaching, consulting, education world, right? The world suddenly becomes very small. And this I just find so fun and exciting and fascinating about the folks that I support. Um, like I had a guy yesterday on my podcast that he's an Infusionsoft expert, right? But like, you know, over the last few years has worked with clients in 37 different countries. These are direct one-on-one -on -one clients, right? So it's, I just love, love, love that our global landscape has changed and that, you know, it's so accessible to us. Um, but what it also means is that there's more to understand about being in the online world of business. Um, and so part of what I want, here's Dennis. All right, welcome to Dennis. <clears throat> and let me, I'm gonna just go, okay, up here to everyone in meeting. <clears throat> Pop into the chat and say hello if you haven't yet. Um, let us know where you are from. 
Um, but yeah, the obviously the legal landscape internationally becomes a bit more complex depending on the work that you're doing. So because I really am niche down and serving a very specific market, a segment of the marketplace. Oh, Ireland. Awesome. Welcome. And Masha, I don't know if that's the right way to say your name, but welcome. That's super fun. Um, I've helped quite a few people in the UK. So one, I want you to understand the legal landscape, right? So that's part one. Um, and even if you're international, what I was starting to say is even if you're international, you do have to understand the legal landscape if you are reaching into the US. Most of my international clients have a pretty significant portion of their database or their clients based in the US, right? So this is why they need to understand a bit about the US landscape as well. Um, and then part two, let's see if my arrows are going to work, right? We're going to go through a framework that I developed to help people understand their business from a legal perspective. So this is the, the legal roadmap that I talk about. This is the overlay, the map that you will have in your business moving forward, where anytime something changes in your business, you'll be able to look at the map and determine which bucket you need to look into to take care of that particular piece of growth or new event or new thing happening in your business, right? I want it to feel easy and I want you to feel empowered to know exactly where you should look. So we'll walk through a map, which will be the kind of the simplified version of where you should look. And then at the very end, I'll mention some additional resources and offer an invitation for those who are ready for certain types of support in their business. So, first question, right? And this one is super interesting to me because whenever I speak, and I've done a lot of live speaking at live events with hundreds of people in the room, um, I ask people, how many of you, so if you're with me, uh, you know, type in the chat, how many of you know you have legal needs in your business that are currently unmet, right? Type yes, if you know you currently have legal needs in your business that are unmet. Yes. Okay. Patty says yes. Lynn says it. Yeah. Masha said yes. Um, so usually when I ask people to raise their hand, I will get like a 90%, you know, hand raise rate. Like people know that they've got legal needs. And the reality is that's really consistent with what the small business administration supports, which is that, uh, or, or reports, which is that 90% of small businesses in the U S go without adequate legal support. Right. And really, it's because they are uh, fairly excluded from the marketplace. And we'll talk about why copywriting mainly, most likely. Right. And Annie, I get a lot of that. Like, I, I know I have legal needs. I don't know what they are. Right. Yes. Bill says here to see what I don't know. Yes. And most of us are harmed in our businesses when things come up by something that we don't know. Right. Not knowing what we don't know. And so um, this is why legal education is so important, especially to entrepreneurs this size, is that how many of you, when you signed up to be an entrepreneur, knew that you were going to have to learn sales and marketing and information technology and business systems, right? <laughs> uh, how many of you knew that? And how many of you have kind of like sorted out that that's been a, an interesting or for some people painful part of the journey, right? You have to become essentially your own expert in each of these areas unless you are immediately hiring out support. But even then you still have, right? Bill says, oh yes, many hats. That's, that's it. We're all truthfully technicians, right? Using a little Michael Gerber speak, we're technicians. We show up because we want to do a certain thing through our business. And then we end up wearing all these other hats. Well, you know, hopefully many of you are at the, at the point of outsourcing or you have outsourced some of those hats. But if you haven't, and you're like many of my clients, you do have to learn a thing or two about each of those areas, even before you can outsource. You're responsible for the leadership of your business and leading people to do the work that you're asking them to do, right? So legal is no different. And again, this is why everybody in, in the world that I serve, everybody needs a bit of legal information. Right. So is the traditional model broken? Well, the fact that 90 percent of small businesses go with their legal needs not being met, in my opinion, it is. We have a vast need that is not getting met. We as providers know that that need is there. You as business owners 
know that you have the need and we still are not connecting the dots, right? To me, that, that tells me that there is a marketplace that is broken. Uh, so it's also why I decided to be creative in the way that I put some of my services together to try to solve that. Um, but here are some of the things that I hear from my clients and people in the communities that I'm involved with, right? Oh, that won't happen to me, right? Or I've got the best clients. This one I love. I have the best clients. That would never happen. Um, many people think like, well, if a problem comes up, then I'll deal with it, right? They're just not ready to deal with it now. And usually it's because they don't understand the scope of the problem, right? Or this one, which, you know, I understand. I don't like lawyers. <laughs> I went to a conference one day and I sat next to this woman and she was in landscaping or something. And she asked me what I did. And I said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm an attorney. And she looked at me and she goes, oh, you're the scum of the earth. And I sat there kind of waiting for, you know, her to laugh or there, but then she literally just kept like deadpan. I was like, Ooh, so needless to say, I chose a different spot after lunch, but I get it. People can have really unfortunate interactions with our legal system and, and with attorneys. And, you know, I think in her instance, it was like, you know, a family, family member's death and lots of fighting over inheritance, that kind of stuff, right. Which can be awful. We, the irony of our legal system is it's set up to be the best in the world for justice, and yet it is still really horribly painful if you get caught up in it. And so I understand why people don't get their needs met, right? But the question that I would ask is, because it's not, the question isn't, can you afford legal support? It's, can you afford the loss of, you know, fill in the blank, your business, certain personal assets in your life? other things, depending on where you're at. And we'll walk through the map so that you understand a bit more about what I'm talking about. But first, if you are in the U.S. landscape, right, we have to start here by understanding the uh, the business law connection is what I call it. There's, there's really nothing that you can do in business that does not have some rule around it or parallel or something in the law that you need to know about, right? And, and the risk is quite high for small businesses because they tend to be undereducated, under-resourced, but they're playing in the same landscape as the big dogs, right? And so uh, I love this quote, Napoleon Hill, for any of you that have studied Napoleon Hill. Um, oh yeah, Eva says, I thought I had great clients too until COVID. Yes, oh my gosh, you guys, I have some COVID stories as far as, uh, you know, clients showing up that have never faced chargeback requests before that had never had like tumultuous client issues. And then COVID really, you know, brought out some stress and some things in people that made it hard for a lot of small businesses. But yeah, it, it is true. Um, so this quote, the single greatest trait of su successful people is the process of accurate thinking. Um, Bill, <laughs> better at breaking deals than making deals. Oh my gosh, that's right. Well, and it really is true that that law can be used in a supportive way, but it can also be used in a way to interfere with business. And my goal is always that you have adequate supports, but that you're not uh, overdone, right? You're not having contracts and terms and things in place that will get in the way of business, but that you, you create clarity and a container for those relationships that you create in the course of your work so that everybody wins, right? I'm very much, even in my drafting, I'm very much, I always draft towards a fair and equitable outcome for parties because I want to work with people who believe that things should be fair and equitable and are willing to put in the work to make it fair and equitable versus somebody that shows up and says, I want a bulletproof contract, right? I'll just tell them there's no such thing. And, and if you're looking for bulletproof, like I'm the wrong person to talk to, we can talk about reasonable supports and reasonable structures and how to create a business system that incorporates legal um, in a way that is supportive of your business. But I, you know, I agree, Bill. I, I really, uh, it, it rubs me the wrong way when I see certain things drafted or put together in a way in the legal world that is distasteful like that. Um, all right. So, and I'm sorry to anybody here that's had an unfortunate uh, interaction with our legal system. It's a tough place to be caught up in. Um, we're going to walk through a few statistics. This will help you get to know the business landscape 
I tell people, don't worry, it's going to feel like the sky is falling. It really is not because on the other side of this is the framework that we're going to walk through that will help you understand, um, you know, pretty efficiently how to take care of your business. You don't need to take notes on this. There'll be a, a slide if you want to uh, screenshot the statistics that we'll, we can walk through. Um, but again, this applies to folks outside of the U.S. who are reaching in. As one example, I had a Canadian client who uh, were doing some contract work, some IP work for him, and he didn't realize when he chose a trademark, and his audience is worldwide, and probably 60 to 70 percent, maybe even 80 percent of his audience is based in the U.S. He's based in Canada. He chose a mark that was already registered in the U.S., but because of his internet-based business, right, it is determined that you are reaching into the U.S. marketplace. So he ended up on the receiving end of, um, you know, threatened litigation over use of this trademark. And so we had to resolve that. And I jumped in and pretty efficiently, we got that resolved. He ended up buying both marks from the U.S.-based company. And so we got a settlement. He now can advertise wherever he wants, you know, in, in at least when it comes to US and Canada and is covered. But he had no idea when he started that he needed to be thinking about US-based registrations and do that level of research. So that's why I like to remind people who are international that you do have to be aware of what you're dealing with in the US. Okay, so let's run through these numbers. Each year, more than 15 million lawsuits get filed in the U.S., right? And I tell people I'm pretty good at math, and even that number still boggles my mind. Um, of the civil lawsuits, because that's both civil and criminal, but of the civil lawsuits, 52% are against small businesses. 52%, more than half of the lawsuits filed in the U.S. are against small businesses uh, on the civil side. This collectively costs us as small business owners between 230 and 260 billion dollars a year. That is a massive amount of money and we're a huge percentage of the GDP. So from a numbers perspective, these numbers are not on this list, but small businesses, and I'd be curious if, if any of you know, what percentage of businesses in the US are small businesses? I Type your numbers in the chat, I wanna see who's awake really and, and good for you if you're still here with me about 80 percent okay that's a good guess bill anybody else what percentage of businesses in the u.s are small businesses patty says 50 percent okay totally fair guess M maggie says 99 Brittany 65 yeah these are all good guesses uh maggie you would win if we were you know playing the um i forget the game where you have to get the closest 99.5 percent of businesses in the U.S. are small businesses. From a numbers perspective, yeah, Bill, we are a huge part of the GDP. We're not quite 80 percent. Collectively, small businesses are 42 to 43 percent of annual GDP. But from a numbers perspective, based on, you know, numbers of businesses, we are the marketplace. And granted, the, the small mega, the small number of mega corporations that you hear about, the irony is that these are the ones that make the news, right? Starbucks, Nike, Walmart, blah, blah, blah. The, the big guys throw a lot of weight around and they matter to our economy, but but small businesses are also essential to our economy, right? So this is a big hit, 230 to $260 billion a year costs us as small businesses. With 60% of, of small businesses, 60% of those claims against small businesses being contracts-based claims, right? Contracts-based claims. I want you to understand the numbers so that we can target specific areas in our business that need support to deal with the biggest risks. Um, yeah, lady says they the lady Jane says they target us because we are the base. It is true that business owners can be targets. This is the other reality. I was raised, my dad was an entrepreneur, still is, and he ran mostly brick and mortar businesses, right? And as a kid, I worked in those businesses, but multiple times he was targeted with fraudulent scams, right? It is true that that small businesses regularly are targets and there are certain people that are willing to try to take advantage of a situation. Um, so 60% of those claims are contracts-based claims and 60% um, of all businesses face at least one significant legal event 
once every two years, right? So, and this could be anything from an employee, like a, a wage issue, could be a, a labor issue, could be an IP issue, a database breach, could be any number of issues uh, generally that happen because we're online, because we interact with people, right? It's the nature of business. Um, okay, going through the next batch of numbers, and then we'll be done with our numbers. If a lawsuit gets filed against a small business and does not go all the way to litigation, on average, it takes 8.7 months to resolve. So almost nine months to resolve. Yeah, the 230 to 260, Lady Jane, was the, um, the it, what it costs us collectively as small business owners on an annual basis. And that's in the billions, 230 to 260 billion dollars a year that, that litigation costs small businesses. Um, the second number on this slide, if litigation gets filed and has to go all the way to litigation, 21.6 months on average to resolve, almost two years, right? The better part of two years. On average, these claims will cost a small business between $3,000 and $150,000 per event, with 90% of them costing more than $10,000 per event. And this is even in the event of a fraudulent claim, a mistake, something that, that happens that wasn't really wrongful or even intentional, but you have to hire legal support, you have to investigate it, you maybe have to respond to pleadings, whatever the case may be. The average claim against a small business, right, in the contracts bucket that goes to litigation costs a small business $91,000 to resolve. And so my question for small businesses is, can you afford a $91,000 hit to your business this year or next year? For most of my clients, that's a significant hit, right? That would not be an easy thing for them to swallow. Here's the numbers if you wanted to do a screenshot instead of taking notes. Um, but understanding the landscape, because most people, if you don't live inside the legal landscape, it's really easy. What I see time and time again that gets my clients in trouble is they think, I'm too small to matter. My business is too small to matter. I'm not Starbucks. I'm not Nike. I'm not, you know, one of these big players. So I don't need to worry about this. It's just not true. And so, you know, the thing that I like for people to understand is that we are in a landscape where we do have to understand what's going on around us and the pool in which we're playing. Um, and this, you know, this issue, I litigated the first 10 years of my career. So I, I you know, come from the world of litigation and I would regularly help my clients at the start of litigation understand that the cost of litigation is always driven by the most unreasonable party. That's usually, I'm just gonna say it, that's usually not the small business owner. Small business owners typically are very customer oriented, service oriented. Most of us wouldn't be in business if we did not care about our customers, right? And so usually what I see is there's somebody who is quite unreasonable on the other side and they're dragging a small business through, uh, through our legal process to wage economic warfare, prove a point, right? They have some internal wounding and they've got some personality disorder and they take it out on you. And that is the reality of who can end up inside of our, our legal landscape. Yeah, Bill says 91K is cheap. Totally. Yeah, it's no, it's it's absolutely right. That's average for small businesses, but there are plenty of numbers that go outside of those ranges, right? That go outside and, and above the 150K. That's right. I helped a small business with an, an altercation that cost them about $250,000, dollars to, to internally. That was the cost even before litigation. And then before finding me, they, they owed another law firm over $90,000 in legal fees. And the case wasn't even settled, right? So I get it, Bill. It's, it's really painful to see those, uh, those scenarios come up. So um, just understand you're not in control of the process and that's what makes it risky, right? And that there are unreasonable people that sometimes come across our path in business. Um, so business is rewarding, right? Let's go back and connect with our big why because for a second, it felt like the sky is falling. I know that, so take a big breath. We're all still here, we're good. Um, but 
we do get to choose our protections. And this is usually where people have a lack of empowerment. They just don't know what they need. They don't know what protections apply to their business, right? So this is my goal is to help people on the other side of this understand you can proactively put things in place that will help you avoid some of these biggest risks. Um, Oh, yeah. 5.5 years in a legal battle is rough. I'm so sorry to see that. That's um, I hear those stories and it's ugh, those are horrible. Uh, one of my first law school, one of my first cases that I was on right out of law school was a construction defect litigation case. There was a massive home built on Mercer Island, which is right here in Seattle and uh, a really um, atrocious, really high-end home builder who was maxed out at the time that he built this home, hired crews and subcontractors that didn't know what the heck they were doing. And it was a basically a $6 million home with $6 million worth of defects. And so um, it was an atrocious case and a long drawn out battle between um, the parties and hiding money offshore like it was crazy and it lasted for years and at one point, um, you know, there were like 21 different legal teams involved in this case and I was responsible for all the documentation. We had over 200,000 pages of documentation on this single case alone. So I, Lady Jane, I totally understand the nature of big litigation and, and dragged out litigation. And that's what I wanna keep people out of. So how many of you are ready? Type yes, if you wanna learn the simple, uh, the simple map, the legal roadmap to your business that hopefully my goal is helps you as your business grows and evolves and you understand where you need to look anytime something comes up. Perfect. So I just call it the five buckets, right? I needed a way to organize information and help people easily understand it. Uh, sorry, I was driving earlier. No worries. I totally understand, Masha. Good for you showing up and listening. Um, and the good thing is I am recording this. Thank you to whoever reminded me to record it so that you can access that later as well. Um, how many of you feel a little bit like this when it comes to legal, right? This is usually like when I intersect with clients, there's a lot of questions that people have that they've been saving up or they don't know. Um, they don't know the answers to, right? Because there's a lot of moving parts in our businesses, right? What's the right business structure? Uh, do I own my domain? What contracts do I need? How do I know if I have IP worth protecting, right? What if somebody takes something that I put online? I intersect with a lot of people who are afraid to push their programs or brilliance or information out online because they don't know how to protect the stuff in the online space, right? What, what do I need in a privacy policy? Yep. And then um, what do I need to know about hiring people, independent contractors, employees, right? What about regula regulatory bodies? What is the FTC, right? So many, so many questions intersect in this space of business. And especially when it comes to doing online business. Um, so here is the five bucket framework for simplified business protection, right? If you wanna understand your legal needs and I, I, you're welcome to take a snapshot of this, they are generally gonna fall within one of these buckets. And granted, you know, business insurance isn't exactly legal, but I get a lot of questions about where insurance fits. And so I do present on it so that people understand where it fits as part of the puzzle. Um, so let's start and you'll, you'll notice that there's five buckets, slightly different sizes, right? This is for a reason. Um, and then there's also a yellow arrow that is circling around behind the buckets. And what this is a reminder for is that at any point in your business, you need to be able to do what I call uh, a rolling risk assessment of your business, right? Maybe you're hiring a new person launching a new course or service or program or product, right? Maybe you are, um, you know, creating a whole avenue, a new, a new avenue for um, revenue in your, in your business, a new revenue stream in some way. Uh, whatever it is that you're doing, building team, maybe you're getting into the joint venture space or launching an affiliate program, right? These are all ways that we can expand our businesses um, each, each one of these things, you need to do what's called a rolling risk assessment and ask yourself, what do I need to protect this new growth, this new thing that I'm doing in my business, whether it's a new relationship, a new revenue stream, a new service or offering, right? 
Um, so that, that's what the yellow arrows stand for, is that this is not just like marketing or sales or not set it and forget it. You have to revisit those things, re revisit those processes, revisit those resources and update them from time to time. Okay, so first bucket, let's start with business structure. This is really the foundation of your business. Type yes if you have yourself set up as an LLC or maybe a C corporation, you're incorporated. If you're international, you might have another entity type, right? So Donna says yes. Um, Masha, oh good, looking at what you're up to. Oh, I love that. The horse world. Um, so if you don't, right? Uh, F S Corp, Bill says he has an S Corp, incorporated, and then S Corp, that's excellent. Lady Jane says no need to. Okay, we can talk about that, Lady Jane. Um, the And the S Corp, what, what you should know about S Corps, because I get a lot of questions about this, right? And we won't go real deep into each of the entity types, but generally what I see and what I'm dealing with in this space are LLCs or C Corps. Um, you can make an S Corp election, right? So S Corp is not an actual legal entity type. It is a tax election status that overlays either an LLC or a C Corp. So at the state level, you either set up an LLC or you set up a C Corporation, and then you made the S Corp election to treat that entity in a certain way from a tax perspective. But the S Corp is a great fit for a lot of people in this space. So it's a good thing that that came up. Um, but essentially, if you think of your business, right, and a business structure, um, think of the foundation, because I, I'm a very visual person, but that your business structure, think of a foundation to a home or a building, right, a big concrete pad, maybe it's a little log cabin, however you want to think of your structure, but think of what the foundation looks like. Right. And this is what your business structure does to you, does for you. It is the foundation of your business. It is the only way to separate business liability from personal assets. Right. It provides tax advantages that are not otherwise available to you. Right. Maybe you've heard the phrase um, uh, uh, individuals get taxed, corporations get wealthy. That's a true story. Right. You get so many advantages in our tax code when you incorporate or when you create an LLC that you otherwise do not have access to. So even from a, just a logistical perspective, it makes so much sense to incorporate. Um, and then finally, this final piece, it improves your likelihood of success. The interesting thing, because there's a lot of people, the reason I, I start here, and it may seem obvious to some people, but over 60% of businesses in the U.S. remain sole proprietors. 60% of small businesses. That's massive. Number of people that are running around putting their personal assets at risk through their business, right? And so many people in the online space think, well, you know, I don't really have any risk. I'm just running my business out of my little home office, you know, whatever. It's, it's a lot of minimization about our roles as small business owners in the States. But the reality is if you have personal assets, you've got money in the bank, you own a vehicle or a home or other things in your life, or you're married, you're in a community property state and you have a partner with assets, you are putting all of those things at risk if you remain a sole proprietor by not officially incorporating. Now, some people think like, well, I have a DBA, I registered, you know, I've got a business license, I have a DBA. DBA is different. DBA is a fictitious business name or it's a DBA stands for doing business as different than officially setting up an LLC or a C Corp or some other legal entity that's a fit for you, right? So with a legal entity, you pay a filing fee to the state. You have to keep your registration updated each year. You also probably have some business licensing requirements and all of that, but um, it's not one of those things that you set up and then you never do anything with it again. You have reporting requirements, annual registrate, annual filing requirements, et cetera. Um, but when you take that step, the difference even in mindset is dramatic. When you start to treat yourself like a business, treat your business like a business, other people treat the work that you do through your business differently as well. So I just want to really emphasize that point. Okay, back to the framework, right? Business structures, number one, visualize that platform. 
right? Now, bucket number two, business contracts. This is a bigger bucket. And the reason it's bigger on the visual is because I spend a lot of time here with clients. There's a lot that is happening inside their businesses, and most of it needs to be protected with some type of business contract, right? So back to the business contracts bucket. If you think about your platform, right? Visualize that platform and then think of a big piece of machinery sitting on top of that platform. That's how I think about my clients' businesses is they're like machines. They have moving parts and, you know, uh, nuts and bolts and screws and different things happening every day in their business. So picture that piece of machinery sitting on that foundation. Your business contracts protect that machinery, all of the daily goings on in your business, right? So your contract should cover what I call every exchange of value in your business, right? You hire an independent contractor. That's an exchange of value. You should have a contract in place for that. You um, Maybe you are launching your first client service, whatever that is in your business. You need to have a core client services agreement in your business, right? That's a core contract. Maybe you launch an online presence, right? You put a website out, you publish articles or videos or set yourself up as an expert in the space that you're in and people visit that website. That's an exchange of value. They show up to consume that information. And even though it's free, free does not mean free of risk, right? You need to have contracts in place for that online presence, your online real estate. Uh, Lady Jane says, are you intellectual property? Yes. So I do IP for my clients. I also do a ton of business contracts, a lot of business formation, a lot of dispute resolution and, and strategic advising on, you know, some things that come up once people are really deep into business. Um, basically, I, I serve a very narrow niche, but I go very deep into that niche. Um, so your contracts, right? We, we do a variety of things in our business. We offer a variety of services. Maybe you, you're a speaker, right? You should have a core speaker agreement in place for that. There's IP issues that come up all the time around speaking and sharing our IP with the world. And especially when it involves recordings and third parties and what is everybody doing with this? Um, yeah, and Masha, we can get to... Uh, contracts downside of just doing common contracts and altering them to suit your business right there there are some problems with that which is which is also why i chose a very specific niche the problem with a place like legal zoom or rocket lawyer or any of the other you know cheap or even free templates online is they're not tailored to anybody they're you know it's if you're tailored to the world or you're a, a free template database for the world you're not tailored to any specific type of business or any specific type of client. And that's problematic. I've seen so many issues come up where people borrowed a contract from their business coach or took somebody's online legal terms and put them into their business. Um, Bill, yeah, the, with contracts, you can quickly get buried in costs and lost time trying to create a contract for every exchange of value. Excellent. I love that. I'm interested in how to keep them short, simple, and quick to produce so that I can get back to building the business. This is a great question. And this is why, Bill, I built an online database of this stuff targeted very specifically to the type of client that I serve. Because I agree, contracts can cost a lot of money. If you're having to go to an attorney and have one custom made every single time, it adds up. And small businesses have generally smaller budgets, right? Um, so, but you do need to understand some fundamentals and I'm here to help you understand what those fundamentals are and how you can easily meet those needs in the various buckets that we're covering. Um, but the exchange of value in your business, what you're going to ask yourself, right? And especially for the circumstances where you have IP trading hands, and this happens in client service scenarios, happens when you're leading workshops or when you are um, even have paid clients, right? Like, it's so interesting to me because so many of my clients will show up and say, you know, this person took my course or they went through this particular training and they ripped it off. They they paid me for it, but they stole it and now have put it into their own business, acting like it's their own IP. And it's first of all, it's horrible that this happens. And it because the wild, you know, the the internet, the online world of business is the wild west of business. It continues to happen. Um, but 
there are some stop gaps that you can put in place to, that will not only help decrease the likelihood of this happening, but if it does happen, give you a way to resolve that scenario much more easily than you would if you did not have any protections in place, right? And the other thing that I see happening is people just don't launch things online or they don't put their program or their offerings out there yet because they're afraid of the legal stuff. They don't exactly know how to protect it. They think it's going to cost them too much. And so they sit back and they take too long to get things to market. And I don't like seeing that either because I want my clients to do well and push their ideas out into, into the world. Um, the other thing about contracts I want to cover is that they are there. Many people think about contracts like fences, right? Have you ever heard the phrase, good fences make good neighbors? I was in real estate law for years as well. And so um, that one, Bill says, yep, <laughs> uh, don't go into real estate if you don't want to see some of the worst, nastiest fights between people. They get crazy over property. Um, but it's, you know, there's there's some truth in that. But really the way that I think about contracts is they're containers for the relationship, right? They're not going to save you from a bad relationship. I will say that if you are in business with the wrong person, you, um, you know, you ignored some red flags and you took on a client that ultimately should not have been your client, a contract won't save you because there's, you know, 29 ways that that can go wrong, probably more. Um, but for the vast majority of the people that we work with, the vast majority of our clients, even some of the stinkers that, that cross our path, um, and I say that lo lovingly, but there are lots of stinkers that cross paths with us in business, and even simply from the perspective that a certain percentage of the population has personality disorders. I have to remind people business is a numbers game. It really is a statistical model and you can do your best, but you can't always keep people like that out of your business. And so this is where having some core supports in place can really streamline things for you, keep you out of litigation, help you move through some of those periods of turmoil or having to deal with tough stuff much more easily. It's the difference between like running a racetrack without any hurdles on it versus a racetrack that's just full of hurdles, right? I want to help you get those hurdles off the track before you run. Um, so contracts, think of them as containers. They're there to guide the relationship, to be supportive, and to, and to also give you clear outs. What happens if, right? And if you have contracts done well, they do that. They guide people on scenarios that come up that are sometimes unfortunate, but they they save you from the headache of having to uh, go to battle against somebody who's extremely unreasonable when you didn't have any terms in place. So they are they are truly one of the most critical pieces of of running a business smoothly. Um, and then the other thing about contracts is they are the gatekeepers to your IP. They can actually help you protect your intellectual property because they're going to say things like, here's what you can't do with this information. Here's what you can do, right? You're going to have, if, if you've done it the right way, you're going to have license language inside, license, licensing language inside of that contract that deals with your IP if IP is one of the things that's being exposed. And for most of my clients, it is inside of every service, inside of every offering, inside of every digital course or thing that they do. Um, and Lady Jane says, be careful who you get into business and relationships with. Absolutely. Pay attention to those red flags because people often, whenever I have a client that shows up and we're having to deal with a dispute or some kind of litigious scenario, I asked them, what were the red flags, right? What happened early on that you potentially ignored or glossed over? And I helped them because I want them to change their business practices moving forward, right? But it's absolutely true that we can miss those or, or see them, but, but not really pay full attention to them. Um, okay, going back to the visual, right? Business structure, business contracts, we've dealt with the, the foundation and the machinery sitting on top of the foundation. Business insurance, if you think about that visual, your business insurance is like padding that goes around the whole thing, right? It is that extra peace of mind. So let's go to business insurance, right? It is extra protection for your business and your assets. It gives you additional peace of mind. Business insurance is unique to your business, right? There is no one size fits all. Yes, there are some standard policies that many people should get, 
But the thing about insurance is, is like other needs in your business life, it might change as your business evolves, right? Um, and if your business, let's say you're a home-based business uh, that does you know specific things, but is limited generally to coaching and consulting, that's going to be very different than a business that has some physical presence or that runs live in-person events, right? You're going to need event coverage in place for those types of uh, the parts of your business where you are in the event space. Um, so insurance, you know, it's really mapped to what you're doing in your business, just like your home. Think about getting homeowners insurance, right? Do you have to go through the questionnaire like, do you own a trampoline or a swimming pool or a dangerous dog? <laughs> it's essentially the equivalent. What things are you doing in your business that as an insurance provider, we need to know about so that we can insure you against that risk or that loss, right? So um, what I generally recommend, because there's 13 different kinds of small business insurance policies, right? Ranging from, um, you know, some of the standard ones, general liability insurance, a business owner's policy, um, you know, for anybody who's also a licensed professional, right? You've probably heard of errors and emissions, or it's also called professional liability insurance, right? If you have employees, you might have to have workers' compensation insurance, which is state regulated. Um, so there's a long list of insurance options for you. But what I highly recommend is you connect with an insurance broker who gets to know your business that you develop a long-term relationship with. And so as your business needs evolve over time, you can update those at least on an annual basis, make sure that you're covered and make sure if you need to add any additional policies that you do, right? How many of you have umbrella insurance, right? This is a level of insurance that's really inexpensive. You generally are going to add it on to like homeowners and an automobile insurance that will protect assets up to a certain level beyond the other the limits of your other coverage right the, your other policies so super important if you're a person that has assets in your life that the full extent of your assets the full value of your assets are covered by insurance okay and then keep in mind that business insurance protects against very specific types of risk and very often there are no other ways to protect against those risks so as an example um, I grew up studying classical piano, and so uh, all my life I've lived on pianos. And um, and my dad is a he loves he's kind of this Western antique. He's a cowboy through and through, but really Western antique guy, and he loves old, beautiful like wood pianos. And so he will buy them from time to time, kind of as a collector, and he resells things, but. Um, he'd purchased this extraordinary piano. There was a very limited number made of, you know, made of these particular types or, or year of piano. And, um, and the guy that repairs them had, was in the process of moving shops. So he had this warehouse full of pianos and was getting ready to move to a new location. And my dad, he'd been working or, or, holding this piano in his in his workshop for like a year right and my dad still hadn't taken delivery and out of the blue my dad calls him up and says hey I, why don't you you know I think I'm ready for you to deliver that piano can you bring it over and the guy has to load it into a horse trailer or something and that and one other piano he took this big trip across country delivers that piano to my dad and while he's gone on that trip his workshop burns down to the ground full of beautiful old antique pianos, like one of a kind pianos that he was refinishing. And when my dad told me the story, I was just like sick to my stomach, right? As a pianist, I'm like, oh, that hurts my heart so much. I said, dad, please tell me that he had insurance. And my dad says, well, he did. He let his insurance lapse on that location and his insurance person helped him put it a policy in place on his new location. Pianos hadn't been moved yet. So he lost literally everything in his business, you know, in that one event. And it's a horrible story, but it highlights that insurance is there to protect against very specific kinds of risk. There's no other way 
to prevent against risk of fire, right? And I know that risk of fire is not going to be a significant risk to most people here, but you know, if you have a home-based business, like you've got those types of risks, but you have other risks, right? And and you cannot necessarily protect against those other risks with a business contract or with a or with a legal entity for your business. Insurance is very unique in that way. And so it is really important that you understand your risk and that you look at what it takes to get that protection in place. Okay. Um, and then, like I said, develop that long-term relationship with your insurance person so that when you have questions and if you're reviewing your policy, you've got somebody to call to have them, you know, help you walk through that because understanding your policy is going to be really important. All right. We're almost there, you guys. Uh, you've done an awesome job of hanging in. We have covered the top three buckets and now we've got the bottom two, right? Let's start with IP protection plan. Right, so IP bucket number four. This is your. Uh, this is the bucket where, and and for those of you that don't know what IP is, let's start there. IP is intellectual property, right? It is generally, and let me ask a question for those of you that are that are with me and are willing to participate in the chat. What percentage of your business value do you think IP represents? So just guess the percentage. I'd like to know what numbers you think IP, intellectual property, represents in your business from a business value. Patty says 80%. Um, Maggie says 100. Yeah. Eva says 98%. Angela says 99. Yep. Lots of highs. Uh, Bill says in his case, the client owns virtually all the IP. Okay, Bill, we can talk more about that. Lady says 100. Yeah. Okay. So good guesses generally is going to be around 90% for the type of businesses that I, yeah, that uh, Masha said, can you give another name for IP? Yeah. So intellectual property is going to be all of the intellectual assets that you create through your business and your work, right? So for some of us, it might look like, right, because I, I support authors and speakers could be their like the script to their speech. It could be a video of it. It could be the book that they write. It could be uh, workbooks, right? So tons of my clients are coaches and consultants. They're experts. They they teach people things. And so their slide deck, their, um, their methodologies, their systems or frameworks that they put together to present uh, concepts a certain way. Yeah, Maggie said, it's my everything, being a thought leader. That's right. Basically the work. That's right. It's basically the work. Um, yeah, and Bill, definitely IP is going to be a huge issue for nonprofits and, and most businesses these days, because you really truthfully can't be in business and not have an online presence. And to be able to compete in the marketplace for attention, for funding, for, you know, any number of things, you have to create IP and you have to manage it well. So, um, the other ways and, and quickly, because let's talk about, you want to talk about the difference briefly between trademarks and copyrights, right? I feel like this is important because I get a lot of questions around, what do I trademark? What do I copyright? People can sometimes mix them up. If you think about your business or brand like a mountain, how many of you live close to a mountain, right? I do, like, like occasionally from my neighborhood, depending on the day Patty's raising her hand, I can see Mount Rainier, right? And snow-capped peaks peaking up above the clouds. Bill says it's flat in Florida. Yeah, I forgot, Bill. I forgot you're in Florida. Sorry about that. Um, so, but when you when you look at a mountain, right, in the distance, raising up above the clouds, or maybe you're on a plane, right, those snow-capped peaks, that's what you protect with trademarks. That's what's visible from the marketplace when it comes to your business. That's going to be your business name, your business or brand name, right? It's going to be your tagline, or a short phrase that you use that's really synonymous with your business. It's going to be uh, maybe a signature course or program or offering, right? A title or a phrase, a short combination of words. Could be a single word, right? So look at Nike. The brand name Nike, right, uh, is going to have a trademark around it. The logo itself, because you can also trademark a logo, is going to have a trademark, as well as the uh, the slogan, right? Just do it. The tagline, just do it. <clears throat> All of those things are protectable by trademark, right? All of those things are assets that are very visible from the marketplace. It is brand recognition. So that's what's protectable by trademark. 
Now the rest of your business, right? The, the part that's under the clouds or the base of the mountain is what is protectable by copyright, right? Copyright registrations. And that is the body of your work. If you're in the space of clients that I typically serve, that's going to be the various assets that you create by way of, you know, coaching programs. Maybe you have a digital or online course. Maybe you have a video series, a, a blog or a series of articles that you publish that are informational. Maybe it's an actual book, right? Maybe it is um, a series of worksheets or a workbook that goes along with one of your presentations or your course. Yep. Um, so, you know, think of your brand or business in that way, the snow capped peaks being the top protectable by trademark, and then the rest of the mountain, the body of your work being protectable, pr protected by copyright registrations, right? So, so within this IP bucket, you have multiple strategies for protection. And remember, we also cross-pollinate a little bit. If I go back over to the slides, remember that we can use business contracts as the gatekeeper to our IP, right? And what I mean by that is in your client services agreement, again, here's what you can do with my IP. Here's what you can't do, right? For many of us, our clients are going to use the IP that we present right? To improve their personal situation or their business, but we're not giving them permission to duplicate our slides or copy our words note for note and turn around word for word and turn around and use it in a commercial manner in their business, right? This is what I mean about restricting certain uses. Um, and so contracts can act as the gatekeepers, just like in an online course or digital product, right? You're going to have those online terms. And within that, you're going to have a section around IP, super, super critical to your business and to the protection of your intellectual property. Um, if you're entering into a joint venture or you're potentially hiring somebody in your business, right? You're going to want a non-disclosure agreement in place or somewhere in the documentation so that people can't take the ideas generated inside your business and go use them in ways that you did not authorize outside of your business. So, just remember, this all works together like a system, right? Um, you wouldn't have one of these protections in place in lieu of the other. They're all related, but they operate like a system. And so you, you have contracts, especially initially, if your budget is like, look, I can't do registrations yet. You can start generally with contracts, right? And then plan for those registrations so that you stair step some of the legal needs in your business. Uh, but the thing about IP the earlier you understand what it is in your business and the earlier you take steps to protect it, the better off you will be long-term and you can really um, strengthen your long-term uh, brand protection compared to people in the marketplace that don't understand IP, don't take strategies to protect their IP, right? It is the difference sometimes between keeping your business name or losing it, keeping the name to a signature course or offering or program or losing it using a tagline consistently or losing it, right? Um, yeah, it, it does. I know, Lady Jane, to speak to your point, it feels complicated and expensive, but mostly for my clients, it's actually not that expensive, right? Most of my clients have a set of core assets that they need to look at, but you're talking about several thousand dollars, right, for a trademark. Um, it's an investment but it's not an outrageous investment when it comes to long-term brand protection, right? Um, Bill says you ran into trouble with a past, past business with federally registered trademark. Yeah, used by another entity. Totally. That, yes, yeah, so Bill, that's a good point. Some people think like, oh, once you get a trademark, you can just like sit back and, you know, and live the easy life. <laughs> You actually have to defend your mark. You're absolutely right that you have an obligation to police the marketplace because you can end up basically like waiving your right to exclusive use of that mark. Generally, what people want when they are seeking a federal level registration is to prevent that type of use. And so from the court's perspective, if you see it and you don't do anything about it, but you do have to have notice, Bill, you do have to see it. Um, but if you don't do anything about it, 
that's a problem because then it signals to others that, you, you know, it's not an exclusive name and they can begin using it as well. And you can have a whole host of problems, but yes, it is, you know, there are some obligations that come with putting your stakes in the ground when you're a business that is protecting your IP. Um, all right, final bucket. So let, let's look here again. And the final bucket is dispute resolution strategy. So I joke that everybody is just running towards this bucket. We all love disputes, don't we? <laughs> um, how many of you type yes if you've ever had a difficult client scenario or like Bill, past litigation or past you know business issues that have, have cost you some legally? Type yes if you have faced um, a difficult scenario in your business. Yes. And most people that I interact with at some point have had a difficult client cross their paths that refuses to pay or gets into a program, doesn't complete it, doesn't live up to the obligations, you know, um, you know, some worse than that. I've had, I've worked with experts and consultants that end up with somebody inside of a group program and they didn't have terms in place. And this person is running around causing problems in the rest of the group, you know, really rubbing people the wrong way and maybe saying things about you or your business that are causing problems. So there are a lot of issues that come up when we deal with people and support people in our daily lives. Right. And this is also why, um, under having a, a decent understanding of how to deal with those issues in this bucket is super important. And honestly, you know, I don't find that most attorneys teach enough on this topic. I know that people are like, oh, disputes, like you're not loving it. But guess what? To the extent that we can develop skills in this bucket, you could basically cross out dispute resolution strategy and call it communication strategy, right? They're synonymous. Um, so this bucket, if you develop some basic skills, and let me type a book in the chat. This is a super uh, easy book to read. I call I say it's easy to read, more difficult to implement. It's called Difficult Conversations. It was written by Bruce Patton, Sheila Heen. I don't know if I'm spelling these the right way, so forgive my um, uh, Douglas Stone and William Urry. I think there's an updated version like in 2010 or something. These, you guys, these people are brilliant. They lead the program on negotiation at Harvard. I went to Harvard Law School and studied for a week with them under their advanced negotiations program. These are folks that for years would get flown. There you go. Thank you, Eva. Would get flown around the world into really extreme like hotbeds, like international scenarios that require, required like immediate assistance to resolve. And, um, and so they've written a whole series of books, um, getting to yes, getting past no difficult conversations. Uh, so you can go look at the whole series of books written by these folks also usually sponsored by the program on negotiation at Harvard. And, um, but this book, Difficult Conversations, is by far my favorite because it is so easy to read and they, they do such a great job with the concepts that you can begin applying them right now today, not only in your business life, but your personal life. This that what they teach will help you across the board in dealing with tension. And how many of you, I at least I feel like from, you know, in the position that I am where I serve businesses who, who sometimes get into trouble on a consistent basis, not always the same business, but across the board, clients come to me when they have problems. Um, how many of you feel like business can be a game of telephone? Have you ever had that where you've said something or had a, a certain exchange, you thought something was clear and later something comes back to you and you're like, what? That's that's not what I said. That's not what happened, right? The game of telephone is is not a terrible analogy, especially when you don't have contracts, right? Con back to the emphasis around having clarity in our business, clarity in our language, clarity in our contracts. It really helps us when it comes to disputes, right? So um, get this book, read it as quickly as possible, begin practicing some of the tips in there, and you will be really empowered to do a much better job than average in this bucket. And I will tell you that skills in this bucket save you time, save you energy. It is money back in your pocket because you can now handle both internal disputes like within your business, whether you have staff or JVs or affiliates or, you know, other people in your business that you work with um, and external disputes in a totally different way. And bottom bullet, this will drastically decrease your monetary and legal risk. 
people that end up in litigation, usually it's because there was a difficult conversation that did not go well. They did not handle things the right way. People became more inflamed rather than less. They maybe tried to shove it under the rug or be a little bit dismissive, not because they wanted to, but because because disputes make us all uncomfortable, right? It's human nature to not really want to engage full out in a dispute. So um, I just like to mention this bucket because it is an additional skill set that I think we all in business need to learn. And to the extent that you can do this well, will really serve you. And Bill says, yes, even with contracts, because people learn later <laughs> what they signed without reading. That's also a true story. Um, and you know, the thing about human nature, it's not that they're intentionally trying to be a stinker or go against the contract in the training that I attended. And probably some of you might've seen this too, because it floats around out there in the world and other trainings, there's a video that they showed us. And we were a class of probably like a group of maybe 30 people, um, from around the world, all different walks of life, but we were tasked with. Yes, there is a recording, MS, and I apologize for not knowing your full name, um, but yes, there is a recording and I will share that so you can watch it later. Um, but this, the recording that I'm talking about, the video that they shared with us, and we had, we had one task, count how many times the ball gets passed, right? So it was a basketball team that came in and there were, I don't know how many people in the group, but a relatively small number of people. And we just had one, one task, count how many times the ball gets passed. And we thought, okay, this is going to be easy, right? And some of them are bounce passes. Some of them are chest pass, right? So you watch it for about 20 or 30 seconds and you count the passes. Well, the variation in numbers, first of all, was significant, right? There were times where like a body moved in front of the pass. You didn't technically see the pass. There were some other things that, you know, made people come out with fairly different ideas around how many times the ball had been passed. And then the, the person leading the class said, how many of you saw the gorilla walk into the middle of the group and walk out the other side, right? Some people are nodding their heads because now you know the video. I'd seen the gorilla and I was shocked that like half the class, 50% of the people did not even see the gorilla come in. And it it was an example in how different we are as humans in interpreting information, even the same visual information that we are given. Everybody was looking at the same video. Everybody had the same amount of time with it, right? And we had vastly different outcomes. And so this is just a reminder about uh, human nature and about the fact that everything gets filtered through this, this subjective perspective that we don't get to control, which means we also don't get to control outcomes. And this is why supports and clarity and other things in our business are so necessary. Okay. You guys did awesome. That was the, the quick overview of this framework. Obviously, each one of these buckets we could spend a bit more time in, but these are the buckets that as things come up in your business, you're going to be looking into one of these buckets for results, for protection, for a strategy, right? And this is how I would like you to think about your legal supports moving forward. It makes it a, an easier task to understand like, oh, is this a business entity change? Is my business evolving and I'm adding a partner and I need to look at business entity? Or is this a business contract because I have a new independent contractor or a new service or something else I'm doing that requires a contract? Or is it an insurance need, right? I have a new business location or I'm changing something about the way I do business and I need to check back in with my insurance provider, right? Or is it IP, I'm launching a new course? I just developed a whole brand new workbook. You know, I'm going to put it out into the world. How do I protect this? That's going to be in the IP bucket, right? Obviously, the ones in the dispute resolution strategy bucket are pretty clear. End of the, I mean, end of the line, bottom line is that if you don't treat your business like a business, nobody else will. And this, this is true of the IRS. It's true of our clients. It's true of the court system. If you don't show and document all the ways that you treated yourself like a business, you're going to have some adverse events. And, and generally, you know, it's um, even from a client relationship perspective, when you show up to a business and you see that they've got their T's crossed and their I's dotted and systems in place and things are running smoothly and maybe they have automation that supports the process, whatever, don't you just feel like a breath of confidence? Like, oh, 
they know what they're doing. They've got a system. I'm going to walk this path. They're going to take care of me. So demonstrating that you are taking care of your business actually really elevates the client experience also. Um, and then the other thing about law is that you're presumed to know it. You are presumed to know the law. So just like you're driving down the freeway at 70 miles an hour and you're presumed to know the speed limit, you're presumed to know the law that applies to your business, right? And this is a challenge because most regular folks out there running around in the entrepreneurial space don't know the law, right? And all of these things apply. Privacy rules, right? Various um, consumer protection rules, various marketing rules that govern what kind of emails can we send? What can we say? How, you know, how do we not violate? I've had probably two calls in the last week around the telemarketing sales rule and the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. How many people are adding text functionality to their businesses as a way to communicate, right? Opens up a whole new world of risk and some pretty hefty penalties if you do it wrong. So these are the rules that apply and most people don't know them, right? And just like in other areas of our life, our biggest challenge is to make wise choices. Um, I just want to mention a free resource here for anybody that wants to kind of dig back into this or get access to even some of my additional supports. I have my Legal Basics Bootcamp, which is a short little video series. It's like a couple minute videos over a, a, a stretch of five days. And then it links out to some other things like it'll help you figure out what contracts you need in your um, in your uh, bucket number two, right? It walks through each of the buckets and will help you dig in a little bit deeper. Um, but it's also a good refresher, right? Some people are going to go through this presentation and they'll pick up one thing that they can go work on right now in their business. And then, you know, in a few months, they might need to revisit it. And so I've had people go through my Legal Basics Bootcamp because it's so short, probably takes 20 minutes total multiple times as a way to kind of refresh themselves and get um, additional resources. So grab that link and I can actually pop it into the chat as well. Um, Cause I like for people to have that. It's an easy way to kind of go through this again with and save the time. Um, legal. Let me just get the live link legal basics. I think this will get us there. There it is. Okay, let me pop this because this is a, a link that you can copy and paste if you want to, if you're taking digital notes at all, you're welcome to this. Okay, and then um, let's talk just really quickly about what you need in the online space, right? Because so many of my folks, that is their home base, their online business, they're posting information, they're publishing information as an expert, they're developing courses or programs or services that are largely hosted online or have online sales funnels associated with them. So um, the online home base is, you know, I really care that people start there for protections because it's really essential to keeping your thriving business going. Um, all right, just again, another quote. I love Abe Lincoln and I love a good Abe Lincoln quote about the importance of education, right? We get educated on all these other things in uh, business, sales, marketing, everything that we've touched on. And we have to do a bit of that in legal as well. Uh, you're welcome to screenshot this. This is, you know, online activities. If you are doing these online things in your business, you need certain protections in place that are directly related. So the first thing is publishing. Most of my clients publish a ton of information, right? They're experts. They have a body of work that they've created. Um, they might be creating a lot of custom images or infographics or other things that help support their online presence. If you're publishing information generally through a home base or a website, right, you need your website terms and conditions. Your website terms and conditions are, think of them as your ground rules. This tells people what they can and can't do when they show up to your online real estate, right? And um, as we know, people do all kinds of things, including some nefarious things online with other people's information. Um, I've had people rip off documentation that I've built for some clients um, like Lewis Howes or Damon John, some of these folks who have very prominent businesses and they will literally take their legal terms off their site and forget to remove the reference to the other business and just paste them on their own website, right? Stuff like this. People do nefarious things online all day long and they do it with 
bios, they will copy. I've had clients who like whole pages off their site have simply been duplicated and somebody else basically sets up a sham site and tries to make sales off of it, right? Um, collect, function number two, collect visitor data, right? So the first function is publishing data, pushing data out into the world. The second function is about our intake of data collecting data from our visitors. If you've got Google Analytics or any similar program um, on your website, which most websites do these days, if you have a simple opt-in form, right? How many of you are growing a database? T type yes if you are actively building a database, right? Which you should be. All of my clients should be. Donna says yes. Eva says yes. Yep. Maggie says yes. Awesome. Yep. Our, often the money in our businesses is in our database, right? It's the relationships that we're developing with people who need to hear from us around a certain body of expertise. So you have legal obligations around what do you do with that information, right? And that has to be disclosed. You, you can fulfill those legal obligations through a privacy policy. Disclose what it is that you're doing with the data, what you do to protect it, why you collect it, where you keep it, all of those things, right? So um, privacy, as you likely already know, is becoming increasingly important these days. And so we have to make certain disclosures around our collection of data. And if you're like me, where people are opting in from around the world, right, you need a privacy policy that is GDPR compliant and that does certain things, um, make certain disclosures. And I will say, results in certain business practices that support those disclosures. It's not just about having the documentation in place. It's also about changing practices in your business so that you are technically compliant. Um, the third bullet, right? So we're we've already talked about publishing content, collecting data, and then third is selling, right? Selling information online, selling data online. That's transacting sales, whether it's selling them into live services, maybe it's a recorded program or course, maybe it's some other digital offering, right? Um, you need terms of purchase in place specific to those sales. This is different than your general website terms and conditions. You can have a general website visitor show up, consume information from your site, maybe even engage with you, opt in, et cetera, but they're not buying anything from you, right? That's a different transaction than somebody who shows up and purchases something from you. So the terms of purchase are like your digital receipt for that transaction. And, and nowadays where people are really, you know, so many of my clients have struggled with chargeback requests in the last couple of years. They're having to defend against a much higher volume of online fraud. Um, terms of purchase can save you in these instances. And beyond having the terms in place, it's also about having your checkout system looking and operating the right way, making sure that people are doing things in the right order, and then showing this to uh, a merchant account or a credit card processor if you end up having to defend against chargeback requests, online fraud, et cetera. You've got to show them that you've got your ducks in, the ro in a row. And you know, nine times out of 10, you will win those disputes if you've done it the right way. Um, and if you haven't, if you don't have any terms in place, guess what? You've delivered the thing You've, they've, you know, you've already done the work. And in many cases, I've had clients, I had multiple clients that showed up in the last year or two that had done for you services. This was not even a digital or, um, you know, uh, an automated program. This was done for you services in the range of like $6,000 to $20,000 where they interacted with people over the course of a year, they delivered the services, they did all the work. And guess what? They still initiated a chargeback request because they knew they could because of the lack of contracts, right? So people are also more knowledgeable now about these things and these processes. And even, even sometimes when you've done the work face-to-face, -face, people can still initiate this process and win if you don't have proper terms in place. And so those are really painful, expensive lessons, especially for people that are offering high-end services and have actually done the work because you're out of pocket that time. Now you have to hand that money back. Um, so it's, it's you know, I, I hate to see my clients end up in a mess like that, but it happens. 
Um, and then finally, the last two points, right? If you share information related to growing a business, increasing your income, increasing sales. And I work with a lot of clients who also support small businesses, right? They're talking about income and growth and sales. And um, you, if you're doing any of that, you need an earnings and income disclaimer. The FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission, is the online watchdog for businesses in the United States. And, you know, it's watching out for consumers who are often preyed upon by businesses or parties with really unethical practices. And so, um, you know, they don't want anybody thinking it's a get rich quick scheme that they're going to make a million bucks that, that, you know, all of this stuff can happen. And so one, you have to look at your marketing language, but two, you need to make sure that you've got an earnings and income disclaimer that says certain things so that people are put on notice that it's not one of those types of claims or opportunities, right? And that needs to show up on its own link. Some people bury their earnings and income disclaimer inside of other documents. It needs to be on its own footer link on your footer menu alongside these other documents. Um, in terms of purchase, the, you, you know, if what we're, what we're getting to next is how you can get this stuff in place really easily. But I have a more detailed um, training inside of that offer that talks about where each of these goes, how to execute this exactly the right way so that you are checking all the boxes and making sure that you actually achieve what's called constructive notice, right? It's a legal term where you can't just bury terms on the bottom. People have to have constructive notice, which means that they actually were exposed to your terms and had an opportunity to consent. So there's additional information that is available there. Um, and then finally, some people, and this doesn't apply to everybody, there's other things that can happen in the online space where you might need some additional supports. But for the core of my folks, they're covered actually by the first four items on this list. Some folks get to the point of launching their own affiliate disclaimer or program or sharing affiliate links, and then you need some additional language in place for that. Uh, but feel free to screenshot this because if you're doing these things in your business, this is the documentation that you need to support those practices. Um, okay, any questions? Let's just pause now because what basically comes next is online mistakes and client concerns. There's really standard set of questions that regularly come up in this world, but I wanna hear from you if you've got specific questions today. I know we're going a little bit over time, but I'd love to be able to respond to some of those. And then we will talk about the website protection package, which is an offer that I have put together that helps you do all of this stuff, right? If you're going to launch a website or course, share ideas with your audience. If you're going to build, continue building your online database. If you want to understand the rules around using testimonials, right? Or reviews the right way or affiliate links, right? If you want to rest easy knowing that you have the disclaimers in place, etc. You want to protect against friendly fraud like we talked about, right? You want to decrease your chance of having a client dispute or confidently launch a new program. Um, engage in text or an online marketing uh, strategy safely, right? Um, basically, what I've bundled into my website protection package is uh, many thousands of dollars worth of support into an online training and documents targeted towards a very specific type of client. But today, for people that that purchase in the next little while, this is my standard price, by the way. I'm, I'm not like slashing prices and high pressure person. I just want you to know what's there, that it's available to you, that it's designed to fit a very specific type of business. Um, and it's not going anywhere. But the time is now, if you're in the online space and you're doing this work and committed to it, and you don't have support in place yet, you are at risk and your business continues to be at risk for any of these regulatory issues or problems with clients, right? So, and there's some things that I can offer that will, you know, if you, if you purchase in the next little while, you know, the next day or two that I can throw in some bonuses that will help you get additional support in your business, which I would love to do. But this is my standard pricing. I'm not a high pressure salesman. I just really love to educate and then uh, help you clearly see the map for your business. Um, but you know what I ultimately love is people that end up feeling entirely differently about their business once they're through my services, right? So 
uh, Lewis, who is one of my early clients, right, said it's so stressful to make sure that we are protected as online entrepreneurs. When we crossed paths, one of his uh, key key people in the business um, was actively reaching out to attorneys to figure out how do you protect an online business? Not everybody in the legal world lives in that world and understands an online-based business, right? Um, this guy, Sean Fargo, who I love, he is a mindfulness meditation teacher, has an amazing business based out of California, right? He has a whole little family that he wants to protect and this business, this amazing business that he's growing. And you know, at the end of our um, services, right? He's like, I now feel so confident. He came in to me saying, I don't want to keep my head in the sand, but I'm not interested in being overwhelmed by all this legal stuff, right? And so we handled things really quickly. And I love that on the other side of really a short, uh, a short period of time, he had a totally different feeling about his business. Writer Carol, who is the creator of the Bullet Journals and New York-based um, client, I've worked with Ryder probably for five years now consistently, right? So, um, you know, this was one of my favorite things that he's ever said, right? She's genuinely interested in the well-being of my work. That is how I feel about every client is I care about your work. I care about your business in the world, right? Tara Moore, who has a, an amazing program for women. She's an author. She's written an, an extraordinary book, uh, Playing Big. If you're a woman, you should go buy it. I'm just going to put that plug in for her. <laughs> Um, but she runs a women's leadership program. She's extraordinary, right? Great at explaining complex concepts, right? This is how I want people to feel after experiencing any one of my services or packages is that you understand exactly what this does for your business. And it's easy to implement, easy to get support. We'll talk about ways that you can get some additional support as well. Um, but back to online questions or concerns. If you have any questions now, I'd love to open up the floor and answer those for you. Um, and then we can do kind of a, a wrap up at the end. Um, so pop into the chat. You're also welcome to go live on your camera. If you've got a question, I would be very happy to help you um, with answers to that question. And kudos for sticking through this. Type yes in the chat if you have learned a thing or two about your business today from a legal perspective. I'd love to know kind of what your biggest aha or takeaway is. Patty said yes. Felix says yes. Bill says yes. Okay, Angela, yes, of course. Lynn, right? So Share a takeaway if there was one thing that you would like to tackle next in your business. I'd love to know what it is for you. Um, and then uh, trademark versus copyright. Yes, Eva, that's a huge one. That's a really common question for me. Disclosures. Yes, it's all about clarity. Basically, I want people to think about their business and the interactions from uh, between their clients and business, like a series of touch points, right? From the very earliest points of like our marketing language, our online presence, you know, the ways that people begin to get exposure to us, all the way to uh, maybe something like this, a masterclass, a webinar, right? What language are you using? What ways are you creating clarity for your clients? How are you helping to set client expectations? And then the legal process of actually enrolling a client, right? How, what does that language say? How, again, does it support the relationship? And what do you do once somebody becomes a client, right? All of these touch points, we, our business really is one long series of touch points. And the ways that we reduce, um, in response to Felix's post about disclosures, the way that we reduce disputes, confusion, risk is by creating clarity through each of those touch points. So that's a very simplified version of how this all fits together. Yep. Patty says clarification, terms and conditions for website use. Yes. Protecting others from duplicating my terms, my ideas. Clarity on IP was helpful. Yes. IP is a huge topic. I get lots of questions about that. Um, any questions that remain for you after this presentation? Any questions that you have right now? Um, MS, <clears throat> do you help with an anonymity? And is this about remaining anonymous even if you are um, in the online world? Because there are certain states that allow you to, for example, hide a, a personal 
um, residential address. And then certain states where, you know, if you're one of the governors of the business, you have to actually list that in public documents. So partly depends on what level of anonymity you're talking about. Um, but anybody have questions that remain either about IP, about your online business, something that has bugged you in the past that you haven't been able to get support with? I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap up. And let's see. Is there a link to a page? Yes. And let me share that. Thank you for that reminder. I had it down here. It is my website protection package. And it has a really good um, list on this page of what is involved. And let me just grab the live link for you. Website protection package. If you purchase in the next day or two, the thing that I will offer is um, if you don't yet have your client services agreement, I will gift you my template for your one-on-one -on -one client services agreement as well. That's a $350 value. It's what people purchase it in my online store every day. Um, let me grab that bundle link real quick. Um, and so I will gift that to you to make sure that you've got your core service protected as well. And then additionally, you can get support moving forward. And I, I remind people of this. So here's the link in the chat that goes to my, my website protection package page. There's a long detailed list right there of what's included, right? So make sure that you scroll down. There's an orange button if you want to click over to the actual checkout. But beneath that orange button, there is... Um, the list of not only the documents, but the trainings included inside of that bundle. Um, yeah, Bill says, what can you do once somebody steals your IP? Having the protection in place is great, but after the cease and desist letter, you're still looking at spending a bunch of money. Uh, yeah, it's true. That can be a complicated process, Bill, depending on what the scenario is. It's a great question. And there is still hope because there are some ways, and I'm helping clients through this process right now, actually, there are still ways that you can um, achieve some results there. I have a training inside the website protection package that goes through this. But yeah, the first step is you need to analyze because you will hear a lot of people in the online or digital or business space just say, issue a cease and desist, right? How many of you have heard that? Type yes if you are familiar with the word cease and desist. Um, it's a type of letter that gets sent in the legal world or you know that attempts to stop certain types of abuses. And the thing that you need to know about that, let's pretend, which I am, that I'm in Washington and somebody in Florida um, appears to have taken my content and is using it on their site or in their services, right? I get a report through the grapevine. Yeah, Bill says I've been on both ends of them. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Bill. Um, if I send a cease and desist to somebody in Florida, I have to be prepared to defend a lawsuit in Florida, right? You can bring what is called a declaratory judgment action if you were on the receiving end of one of these. And if it's your position that you have not infringed somebody's IP. And let's be clear that in the world of ideas and IP, it's fascinating how this happens. There can be two people on opposite sides of the world that have the same idea at the same time and express it into the marketplace in a similar way. And they have never been exposed to each other's work, right? I see this regularly. And so that is just the nature of ideas, which is why I will just say, which is why being first to marketplace puts you in a power position. I never want clients like holding back on their ideas because they're afraid of taking them to market. They're afraid of exposing them. Now you also need to know how to protect them, right? This gives you a leg up. And actually, let me share an article that I wrote three things that you can do without an attorney to protect your IP, right? And you'll see the website protection packages on that list because it's not one where you have to go hire somebody. I had a client come through this package. Was it last year or the year before? She had previously paid an attorney in her country 5,000, the equivalent of 5,000 US to do this documentation for her. And when she went through my website protection package, she was like, it, it didn't look remotely close to this. It was so different and so um, not, not protective enough of her business. Anyways, it, it can cost a lot of money to get 
hands-on support with your online business. Look at everything that you're doing. But if you're in the niche of people that I serve, I've already built these documents for businesses that are scaling, that are making millions of dollars a year in their business. These documents are designed to give you room to grow, to protect you as you build, right? And to cover the wide range of risks that these types of businesses face in the online space. Um, what was I looking up? I was going to grab a link. Uh, let me think about this. Oh, my free article of the things that you can do, because um, this will help with using copyright, right? How many of you want to use copyright notice the right way as kind of a, a, a signpost on like who owns the work? Because that can be a, that can be a big help in um, establishing, especially if somebody takes your content and they scrape off the copyright notice, right? That's a significant problem. It's like removing a watermark from a photo or something. They're, they're liable. They're, they have significantly more risk and damages in those instances. So um, let me just grab that article. I have so many pages on my website, you guys. I rebuilt my website a few years ago and um, I had no idea on the back end, I had like over a hundred live pages. So I still have to navigate through my, <laughs> my uh, menus often to find exactly what it is I need to share. Here we go. Three things you can do today without a lawyer to protect your online content. But this will walk you through using your, um, your copyright notice the right way. I encourage people to use it liberally, like post it on your website. You need to post it in the right locations. A lot of people will post it at the bottom and they will want to rely on that copyright notice in the footer to protect everything on their site. Don't do that. If you are publishing articles, you're publishing other content, put the copyright notice right at the line following the bottom line of the article. You want it as part of the content that you create. Um, so take a look at that link as well. Uh, yes, Lady Jane, I do have a blog. There are a ton of articles and resources on my blog. So if you go to my website through any one of these links, um, you will see that I have resources and more. And on that on that list of resources is my blog. I've also got a trademarks Q&A page for anybody that's interested in trademarks. I have my bundles, which show up in the first couple links. The website protection package is one of four bundles that make up the ultimate legal toolkit. But I also have a page because I'm a believer that, you know, if somebody, let's pretend that you don't have a website at all and you just needed the client services agreement, you could go to my individual templates page and start there. I want people to have the level of support that matches what they need in their business. And so I've broken a lot of my documents out into individual template options as well. Um, and uh, the question from, from somebody about, does the website protection package, is it a course only or does it include consultation? Great question. So there's a couple ways that you can get support through the website protection package. One is there are videos that go along with the documents in the course. There's also a workshop version of the website protection package where I include a recording of that. If you're if you're my kind of people, you want to sit down and pound out a project in like two or three hours. I know lots of folks like that. That's what the workshop version of that course will do for you. So you could sit down on a Saturday morning like I did with a whole group of people, have a big cup of coffee and complete your website documentation and get your online business protected literally in a couple hours. Um, and then beyond that, if you need additional support and you remain on my list, this is the core component. If you purchase something and you remain on my list, you will get invited to my monthly Ask Me Anything live call, which is a terrific way to get spot support, ask additional questions, go over maybe some issues in your documents. I've had people that bought something from me five years ago show up to my Ask Me Anything live and get additional support. So I build that in as a free monthly call um, as a way to make sure that people are able to get questions answered when they have questions that arise and that doesn't always require scheduling, you know, a one hour consultation with me. Again, I'm so committed to the path of small business. I know that sometimes 
you have a five minute question and that that would be a great learning opportunity for other people on the call. So if you stay on my list, um, that's a great way to get spot support, including for that website protection package or any other documents or issues or anything that comes up in your business that you need help with. You're so welcome. Um, and then the workshop. Yes. Yeah, so Lynn, I did I, I've had the website protection package bundle uh, put together in that way for years. But during COVID, I, I worked really hard to get people in my circle, in communities that I work with, fully transitioned online, right? Many of them hadn't really gone all, all in into the online world. And so COVID hit and I wrote like one of the, I'm in Seattle, so we were ground zero for COVID. And I wrote a very early article on what, COVID will mean for small businesses, right? And I published it to my list and that was like March 3rd. And basically the rest of the world went into shutdown behind us. And, um, and as part of the push that I made during COVID to really serve small businesses, I launched a podcast. I launched my Ask Me Anything Live, which is a live, at the time it was a live weekly call. It has since transitioned to a live monthly call. But I also offered a series of workshops designed specifically to get people online fast with their legal protections. And so I have I have a workshop, one version of the, the website protection package workshop recording that I folded into the course version of the website protection package. And that just gives people options for how they want to go through the content. You can go through it video by video, document by document. You can also scroll right to the bottom start the workshop. Like I said, have a big cup of coffee and go through the whole thing in a couple hours and be done. So I've had lots of people provide feedback that that was their favorite way to do the course. Um, specifically, is the workshop an alternative? It is an alternative. Yes. So you could go, Lynn, right to the workshop and you wouldn't have to go up and go through the individual videos. They're there for you if you want to, if you had a question that is specific or you wanted to review one of the documents, right? You could go back through the individual videos, but you could do either or, or you could do all of them and they would serve you well. I didn't see the workshop listed on the bundles page. No, 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 no. Lynn, what I mean is that the workshop is actually folded into the website protection package. So you get access to both when you purchase the package right? So you can go through the video series or you can go directly through the workshop, but they're all housed inside of the website protection package. Great question. And I'm sorry that that was confusing for you. Um, <laughs> haven't had your afternoon coffee. I know you guys, I'm off coffee right now. I hired a nutritionist. And so uh, I really enjoy my morning cup of Joe and I'm currently off coffee as well. So I sympathize. All right. Any other questions? These are all great questions. Um, and again, as a reminder, if you purchase in the next day or two, I will include for free as a gift, uh, my client, my one-on-one -on -one client services agreement so that if you're in the space of coaching or consulting, you are covering your primary client services as well. If you do not have a great contract in place for that yet, um, I will just show you. So here's my contact information. You're welcome to screenshot that, um, my email, let me update this. I didn't realize this still said info. My name is Heather. You can just email me at Heather at Legal Website Warrior. They will both get to me, but because of like Gmail's spam filters or whatever, Heather does much better than info. Um, Annie, you're so welcome. I appreciate that big thank you. Um, but let me, I can show you, uh, I'm going to stop share on this. Um, and Lady Jane, yes, I do have an affiliate program. If you are interested in sharing my resources and you are connected to an audience of uh, entrepreneurs, especially online information entrepreneurs, I'd be happy to chat with you outside of this call. I've got a whole partner program set up and my business, the back end of my business is run by Infusionsoft. So I've got a great program. Um, but yeah, this is the essential legal documentation and the workshop training that's included in the website protection package. As I mentioned, I would also gift you the, um, and let me just stop share because I want to show you, uh, I'll show you on my website where the additional resources live. Um, let me go share screen and then we'll wrap it up. You guys are amazing hanging in here today. So many good questions. Um, so here's my website, right? If you go to my main homepage, this is what it looks like. 
Um, there is a ton, you guys, you could literally, I'm not even joking, spend a hundred hours on here. Not that any of you are dying to do that, but you could learn so much about the legal side of your business through this resources link. These are my bundles up top, right? So you can get to the website protection package right here through the bundles. It's number two right here. I have a business builder basics for somebody just launching a business. I've got the working package, which covers all the core work you do, um, you know, with your client services, running workshops, speaking, all of that. Business evolution is for people that are really growing to the next level through joint venture agreements, affiliate programs, uh, working with publishers, you know, needing non-disclosure agreements and a variety of other, those types of agreements where you're utilizing a lot of third-party relationships to build your business. Um, anyways, to all together, they make up the ultimate legal toolkit, which is at the top of the list right here. But I've also got a trademark Q&A page. I get a ton of questions around trademarks. So go visit that page if you want to learn more about trademarks and what the process looks like. My blog, if let's just click through here. My blog has a bazillion articles. You can go through a ton of resources just on the blog alone. And then um, I haven't asked me anything live. This is my monthly call that I referenced, right? So I've got a sign up page directly to that. I have some other free resources here. Um, I've got my podcast, which I love. It's been one of my favorite things to come out of COVID. And then this media page, I just want to mention this because on this page, there are a ton of amazing conversations with other leaders in the online entrepreneurial space. And you, you will just click through and it will take you directly to the resource or recording. Um, and so you can hear a lot of, uh, you know, it's a lot of free, I'll just say it's a lot of free legal advice, a lot of free legal information that will help you build your business the right way. But there's a lot of hours on that page, just in podcast conversations, video recordings, et cetera. So, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that the resources there will serve you. Again, the bundles and the, the resources that I mentioned today, the website protection package, you can get through the second link, which is the DIY bundles and templates. And it's right here. So the website protection package is the core protection. This, by the way, is the top selling package on my site because everybody that I serve that's in the online space and is the type of business that I serve needs this package, right? It is really designed for a very specific type of business. So that's it for today. I so appreciate you guys. I think you're amazing for sticking around this long and having a conversation about your business and learning some things. Um, any final questions? And let me make sure my chat comes back up. Yes. Awesome. You're so welcome, Eva. You're so welcome, Donna and Felix. Really appreciate all of the thank yous. Um, pop on over. And if you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me via email. If you do grab that website protection package in the next day or two, I'll follow up with you and gift you as well the client services agreement. So it's a great way to get an additional $350 in value and make sure that you're covering your core services. Um, and Warner, yes, is the recording available? I will be sharing the recording. So if you're on my list, stay there and I'll send out the recording here shortly so that for folks, because I had a lot of people email ahead of time that wouldn't be able to make it asking for a recording. Um, Arlene, you're welcome. Great to see you guys here today. All right. Oh, Annie, you're welcome. And let me, I'm just going to save this chat so that if there were any um, questions that I missed, I can go back through. Alrighty. Um, we hopefully I will see. Oh, thank you, Lady Jane. <laughs> Perfect. Um, super happy to hear from you. And again, I hope that um, even just the presentation alone with the roadmap really serves you well as you navigate, you know, building your business and continuing to do what you're doing and offering your amazing services in the world. So reach out if I can help. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm very accessible. You can hit reply to any one of my emails or uh, just be in touch, but it was great to connect with you guys today. Wishing you well. Bye-bye.